Thank you, everyone. It's great to be on this webinar, and it's uh, so wonderful to have this opportunity to meet with all of you and to do this virtually. Um, I'm very excited to um, have the next half hour with you to talk about uh, my uh, passion, which is working with individuals um, who have um, issues and concerns with, um, with trauma. Um, I have a specialty in working with pregnant and postpartum moms and um, through my work, um, what I've uh, come to realize and what research shows is that um, the um, effects of depression um, during uh, the postpartum years and um, a mom's well-being really affects how um, a child um, develops and um, in terms of their mental health, how they flourish. And so from that, work, I have um, really um, dug down deep into adverse childhood um, experiences and how that impacts um, families and the children and lifelong consequences. So um, with that, um, it's really a, a pleasure for me to, um, again, talk about um, adverse childhood experiences and really the effects um, that uh, this pandemic has had on children and their families and our society. And so what happens uh, during this pandemic and what we're seeing um, is not going to really just be isolated to what is happening um, today, but also um, in the lives of the children and families and, and um, children as they become adults in the future. So I am going to turn off my camera right now and then um, got too many screens open. I don't know what to look at. So I am going to turn this off and then we'll just go ahead with the slide set. And um, I look forward to your questions at the end. So what we're seeing with um, this COVID pandemic um, is that our lives have changed uh, dramatically and swiftly. And uh, we all know that this was very unexpected. Um, I recall back in March, um, life seemed to be relatively normal and then quickly overnight um, things had changed in terms of what we all did on a day-to-day -day, um, basis and um, i'm in newport beach in california and california was one of the first states that was hit with uh, the um, outbreak and epidemic and um, i still remember uh, each day was a very very stressful day um, and it was very difficult to try to keep up with what the CDC was recommending, what the World Health Organization was recommending, what the state was recommending. And so many of us here um, were feeling very anxious and very unsettled. Um, during this pandemic, um, these stay-at-home mandates have really eliminated sources of support systems for many individuals and families. So things like churches have closed, as we all know, childcare services closed, even the social connection um, with coworkers, that has all changed with people working from home. And so individuals have been feeling isolated, um, feeling uh, lack of social connection. And even with the school's closures, um, you know, the families had to quickly find solutions each day on how to take care of their children and even with um, areas with low income, how do they um, get their children to have these meals that, that were once um, offered at the school? So um, again, quick and swift changes, um, very stressful changes led to um, a lot of anxiety um, and especially essential health workers um, like many of us, um, many of us didn't have the option of um, not working or staying at home. And um, our colleagues have, and us, have experienced these unique mental health challenges with heightened risks of exposure um, to COVID and then also um, the co-stress um, of the inadequate PPEs and knowing, are, am I being exposed and do I have the resources and the support to continue to do my job in a safe manner? So many of us were feeling very unsafe, not quite sure um, how to navigate our own life um, in this world, this new world that we, again, uh, were not prepared for. And children, um, needless to say, um, were really affected and are affected. Um, this is really taking an impact on childhood. 
So social distancing um, with children, isolating from their friends. Um, the school systems, like I mentioned, were shut down, um, being forced to be homeschooled, um, being with their family members 24-7, um, and not having the um, outside support for maybe teachers and, um, again, other sports activities where they enjoyed and perhaps had allowed them to form those other connections with others, other classmates and students and have that outlet um, besides their family. Um, again, parents working from home, um, that is a very different situation that most children face. And um, is that necessarily something that was welcomed by the children and or the, or the parents? Um, as many of you um, may have realized that working from home is not necessarily uh, a, a positive thing. Um, there's, um, again, isolation, um, there's stress. You can't separate uh, work from home life and, and that could be extremely anxiety provoking and stressful. Um, children also face this um, absence of important milestones um, such as prom, um, graduation. I know many schools have had uh, these modified graduations, but is that really something that they were wanting or expecting? Uh, many, many children um, are grieving these uh, milestones and not being able to uh, fulfill um, what they had imagined, what they hoped for, and what they dreamed of, and the many years of hard work um, to come to this point where either, again, they didn't have a graduation or that um, in this picture you were wearing a mask and, and not being able to be around uh, the students and the friends that you um, went through this, this challenging experience over the years and not being able to um, have that experience. So the effects of, um, of the pandemic on childhood um, don't just um, include graduation, you know, families being at home um, and isolating, but they also impacted the family structure and the family unit and um, what happens to those loved ones around them. So what we've seen um, and what research has shown is that increased stress levels um, are in fact uh, correlated with increased um, physical abuse and neglect in children. So the parents who are at risk um, experiencing increased stress levels from potentially, and we've all seen this um, since the pandemic, but unemployment rates are higher, um, people are losing their jobs, um, stress from isolating, um, stress from, again, not having the social network and support that they normally would have to be able to um, deal with, again, parenting, the, stress, the stressors that come along with parenting, um, those things have dramatically shifted and um, the quarantine and isolating, those are all the things that have um, escalated um, to then these high stress levels um, that potentially these, these parents and families have not experienced before leading to this increase in, um, in abuse and neglect. And in the end of March of uh, 2020, um, with the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, they saw a 22% increase in calls for minors for, um, for sexual abuse. And 67% um, of those reported that they were family members um, who were the perpetrators and 79% of them were living with the victims. So what you're seeing is that um, with these stay at home orders and quarantine, these family members again are not leaving the house and then um, we're seeing these increased um, rates of abuse. Child abuse though have um, abuse reports had decre decreased significantly uh, from the prior year. Um, and that is uh, really due to um, the uh, lack of staffing um, from these child family resources centers, um, um, the inability for them to actually go out to the homes and do investigations. And so um, that is um, why we were seeing this, this market decrease in child abuse reports. 
And so what we're also seeing is that um, the abuse that's occurring is, um, is continuing and then um, the children are getting to the ER um, a lot later. Um, and then the ER presentations um, for child abuse are much more severe um, than they had been um, previously. We're also, again, um, seeing um, an increase in domestic violence during this time. And then many of you probably have, have seen too um, in the media that, and just around your, your neighborhood, I know that um, with many of these restaurants offering curbside deliveries or pickups, um, that they're also offering alcohol for half off. Um, you know, that I don't know of very many restaurants um, that are not offering um, alcohol as part of this pickup service, which um, historically, as we all know, that um, wasn't the case. And so um, alcohol sales have increased um, more than 50% um, in late March. And then um, alcohol use has, has almost been um, glorified and um, you know people are getting online for for happy hour and having you know quarantinis and um, people sharing their experiences with using alcohol and of, of course um, you know alcohol um, is oftentimes used to um, decrease anxiety to cope with stress and um, as we all know um, working with um, substance use and clients suffering from substance use disorders, um, this is, this is a, a way to cope with, with those um, situations of stress and anxiety. Um, in addition to that, the 12-step meetings where, again, people found a lot of support and, and sources of connection um, went dark for a few weeks until people were able to get up virtually um, but even so, the virtual meetings um, don't necessarily replace that human connection that you get when you are, um, you know, in a room with um, individuals and, and having that, that personal connection. Um, so again, the substance use um, has increased um, a lot because of the stress, the anxiety, um, and then the consequential um, feeling of lack of connection and support. So uh, what we are seeing um, during this pandemic is an alarming increased rate of childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences, um, really as a result from um, increased stress levels, um, individuals finding ways to cope with stress by using substances. Um, and these childhood adverse child, childhood experiences um, include physical and sexual abuse and neglect, uh, substance abuse in the home, household mental illness, uh, parental divorce and separation, and then having an incarcerated household member in the house. And so why is it important that we identify and look at these adverse childhood experiences and especially in context of this pandemic? Well, again, what we know is that um, these adverse childhood experiences have lifelong effects that range from emotional, physical, and social effects. And again, um, they, they carry on to adulthood and the rest of one's life. So uh, the landmark ACE study uh, was done by Folletti and colleagues back in um, between 1996 and 1997. They collected data from uh, patients from the Kaiser system here in California, and they had a really nice sample size. So 17,000 people, that's a lot of people. And what they did was they um, looked at these individuals who came into the Kaiser system for medical issues, um, not mental health, but but um, physical issues, medical issues, and they uh, mailed them these ACE questionnaires after their appointment, a week after, to ask them, have you experienced any of these um, adverse childhood experiences? So the previous slide, so did they abuse, um, experience any physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, household stress? 
Um, and what they found is that 28% um, of these people who responded to this questionnaire said that they experienced physical abuse as a child. So before the age of 18, they experienced physical abuse. 21% um, said they experienced sexual abuse. In that 40% experienced at least two or more ACEs. And uh, what they also found is that um, while these people had responded to these um, positive ACEs, these individuals were also, um, had also experienced and correlated with um, medical consequences, um, emotional, substance use, it was all correlated in adulthood. And furthermore, um, those individuals who said, yes, I have four or more ACEs on this questionnaire, um, they were four to 12 fold increased health risk for alcoholism, drug use, depression, and suicide. So that was pretty alarming. So we had this data that basically showed the more um, ACEs you responded positively to, that you said, yes, I have this, the more likely you were to experience in adulthood, again, mental health issues, um, medical issues, and um, potential for suicide and um, depression. So here's a, um, a table that shows uh, the results from the Folletti study. And you could see here that women reported greater number of ACEs um, and that those with two or more ACEs comprised of almost 40% of the sample and that um, at least two thirds of individuals experienced at least one ACE score. And again, the four or more ACEs, 12.5%. Um, so that is really the almost the threshold where you see uh, a really significant increase in negative health consequences in adulthood with four or more ACEs. In addition to um, the results of this, um, this study, what they also found is that um, ACEs predict the early onset of alcohol use. So each ACE score increased the risk for substance use by two to four fold. And for every additional ACE score, um, there was a 62% increased risk of using non-prescribed medication. So um, it was really clear that again, um, the more ACEs you had, the more likelihood that you were at some point going to um, use substances. Merrick's and colleagues um, completed the secondary analysis um, for um, this data set and they looked at mental health. And what they also found was that um, ACE in any of the category increased the risk of attempted suicide by two to five fold through the person's life. And that six or more ACEs had almost a 25 times increased odds of attempting suicide. Um, and then also um, exposure to ACE um, increased the risk of a depressive episode um, in adulthood, even decades after um, the ACEs occurred. So again, um, experiencing adverse childhood experiences at let's say age 12, um, increased your risk of a depressive episode at any time in your life. So um, there are, uh, again, serious consequences and correlations to um, negative health consequences. And um, in addition to that, to sleep, um, one A score um, certainly had also a higher likelihood of self-reported sleep disorders. So what um, can we do as clinicians um, to really evaluate um, someone's risk for negative health consequences in their lifetime while looking at adverse childhood experiences? So um, in California, um, Nadine Harris, she is the Surgeon General for California and she is very passionate and focused on adverse childhood experiences. And um, I put this website on the screen, acesaware.org. And um, 
she had um, revised the original ACE questionnaire. It's very similar. It just, um, I, I look at it and it's just a more trauma-informed way of asking the questions than the original questionnaire, but it's essentially the same, um, same questions, just asked in a, in a different manner. Um, and then there's also a um, pediatric ACEs and related life event screener. So pearls for a child and pearls for a teen. Um, they are questionnaires that can be answered by the caregiver and then uh, for the child version. And then for the teen, um, it could also be asked uh, or completed by the caregiver and then also self report by the teen. Um, so that original ACEs questionnaire was adapted to a child and teen, um, and it includes questions including um, bullying um, and those sorts of um, adverse childhood experiences that, that we are now identifying um, that uh, children are experiencing. And the, um, the ACE adult uh, questionnaire is, again, uh, one that is um, slightly revised, modified from the original one that is um, more trauma, trauma informed. And what we'll do just for the sake of time is um, go over quickly um, these 10 questions. And I'm just looking at the clock, too, and I am running out of time, so I'm going to go and speed this up a bit. So. Um, these are the 10 questions for the ACE questionnaire, and um, they ask, again, so the first one is, um, do you feel that you didn't have enough to eat? And these are, for the adult, it's, um, it's experiences before the age of 18. So um, did you feel like you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes? Um, second one is, did you lose a parent through divorce, abandonment? Did you live with anyone who was depressed, mentally ill? Um, you live with anyone with a, pro with a problem with drinking or using drugs? Did your parent or adults in your home ever hit, punch, beat you? Uh, did you live with anyone who went to jail or prison? Um, did a parent or adult in your home ever swear at you? Um, did a parent or adult in your home ever hit, beat you or physically hurt you? Um, do you feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were special? Uh, did you experience unwanted sexual contact? And what you do is um, these questions are asked in the questionnaire and then you add up the yes responses and then you get a number out of 10. And this is the um, picture of the questionnaire. Again, there's the website. Um, it's a great website. I encourage you all to go to it. Um, there's also a section on how to score the pediatric and teens. Um, and then they also offer a, a nice training for clinicians. So please visit that if you haven't yet, or um, this is the first time you're hearing about ACEs. And so what can we do as clinicians? So um, very important, please assess for any comorbid conditions um, and stressors. So um, asking about substance use, uh, depression, um, what sort of stress do they have in their life? And, as, and especially now with the pandemic, these are all a little bit different than what we perhaps were asking before. So asking, you know, how has working from home affected you and how has your stress level changed with the quarantine and, and how do you feel about um, your relationship with your children. Um, screen for ACEs, again, um, please look at the questionnaires and the, and the tools and, and certainly be, um, use those and incorporate those into your practice. Um, exploring grief and loss. And so what we've all been feeling, including myself, is this, this grief um, through this pandemic. Um, namely for me, it's been, um, you know, what's ch what have I lost um, in terms of um, the quote normal day-to-day -day life and um, you know what is it that I don't know about what tomorrow brings and um, feeling the uncertainty of um, of what again tomorrow brings and what what are we going to do in a month and what does that look like what does the new normal look like and feeling that loss of um, connection with family with friends with um, the, the support network that you had in the past. Um, be prepared to offer appropriate referrals to your clients and to your um, individuals that you're seeing, um, instilling hope. And what, what does this new normal look like? And is it going to be something that um, together we can all get through and learn to at some point embrace and live with? And then what can we do for our loved ones? Um, encourage them to seek help. Um, there are resources out there. Um, it's nice to know that 
um, you know, certain um, therapists are, are available online um, and virtually and that um, a lot of professional organizations are now, um, again, up um, running virtually, 12-step meetings are, are online. So there's a lot of um, quick um, solutions to um, ga gaining this connectedness to society. Um, again, find ways to reconnect um, with your um, support networks. And then for ourselves is, uh, you know, acknowledging the grief and naming it, acknowledging what you're feeling um, during this pandemic as a healthcare provider and, and as a human being, uh, remembering to reconnect with your loved ones and uh, refocusing on relationships and connectedness. And then grounding technique, I just, um, I, I had a, a nice meeting last week with a, a few colleagues in a webinar, and this was a grounding technique that we uh, we had shared at one of our webinars. But it's um, one that's also used for children: is you know, look around and, and name, you know, five things you can see, four things that you can feel, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So taking a few minutes to to be quiet and to think of these things, and then if uh, I always love this slide. Um, it is a provider resilience phone app, and I um, borrowed this from my my colleague um, and supervisor Jamie Vink. Um, and this is a a nice app that um, providers can download. And what it does is it um, it tracks your quality of life. Um, you know, as we work with individuals that are experiencing adverse childhood experiences, um, that could be very triggering. Um, we could experience vicarious trauma. And it's important that we as clinicians um, take care of ourselves because this is a, a point in time where um, those around us um, need us the most. Um, this is a very uh, precarious time where, um, again, the, the fallout right now is going to be uh, the mental health and substance use needs of, of the um, society and people around us. And this is the time where, again, we get to um, be impactful and, and help um, the world. And we've got to take care of ourselves too. So um, I encourage you to download this app. It shows when the last time you had a vacation. Um, it looks at, again, your abil ability to um, assess your quality of life. So that is um, my last slide. I want to thank you all for being on this webinar. And uh, I am looking forward to your questions. So I will see what we have here. Are schools aware of ACEs and how can they learn this? So I know that uh, many um, school districts are being educated on this, but I'll tell you that there is so much work to be done about ACEs. I know that I have uh, I, I have a much longer version of this presentation that is about two hours long and I've spoken at different conferences and it, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in, in the mental health and um, substance use um, industry and um, there's so much more that, that we can all do to educate each other and especially schools. So um, there's much more work to be done. What ACE questionnaire do you recommend? Are they available for free or must they be purchased? Oh, so if you go to that question, the website, um, they're free. You can just print those out. What do you recommend to do for a child that lives with two mentally ill parents who refuse to have their child get the necessarily help that she needs? So if, if this is occurring, I would recommend that you um, contact Child Protective Services if that's, um, if, if they're, uh, if they are in a situation where um, their, their needs are not being met, I, I would certainly raise the flag on that one. When answering the ACEs questions, is it the person's perception if they had a parent they thought was depressed? Yes, and that would be yes. So it is the person's perception. Again, thank you everyone for, for attending. And uh, my email 
and my cell number are right there if you would like to contact me. I love uh, talking about ACEs and what we can do as healthcare professionals to help our children and our families um, become healthier and happier in life. So thank you and, and have a wonderful day.